Great to start standing back there, seeing this view out the windows and the great light, and listening to that music and seeing all these people who are our poetry family. It's really good. <clears throat> Thank you for coming. <laughs> I'd like to thank all the people who are supporting this event financially. Couldn't do it without you. It's 100% supported by our community. <clears throat> Thanks to Mickey for beautifying this building and turning it into something way more than it was Thursday. <laughs> and for John and Grant helping move things around. And John and Jen for hosting one of our poets. And am I forgetting? Um, <clears throat> we're going to start with some of our Wellspring students. In case you don't know, Wellspring is a poem is a program that we have in the fall <coughs> for young people, and we have four of them tonight uh, from over the years. How long ago were you, Lexi? 2014. 2014, and then we have some 2016s. So. Um, First up is Kevin Porter, and Kevin is a senior in high school. He'll tell you a little about himself. Thanks to Stephen and Judith for bringing Kevin tonight. Are you here, Kevin? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Come on up. I <laughs> Entirely nervous here. <laughs> just a little bit. You know, just enough to keep you on your toes. <laughs> anyway, like I said, I'm a senior in high school. I'm pretty psyched to be out here. I mean, I haven't been writing as long as some of the other poets, but you know, I still consider it, you know, a part of me and I really like doing it. I always like places like this, you know, Hockney Hills or National Parks or whatever. It's a real nice place to get away, you know, be inspired, all all that fun stuff. But, uh, damn, I really did not think this through. Anyway, um, let's forget the script and show you what you guys have really been here for. It's here good poetry. And I think I've done something for you. You do. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I hate Monday. Yes, I know. Truly the most original of sentiments. It was hackneyed even when Garfield presented it. Though, on the surface, we're not so different. We don't work. We're both grumpy and have an interesting shade of orange. Him from his color and me from the Cheeto dust on my fingers. So why would we, seemingly similar sad slack slackers, have a reason to hate Monday? Well, I can't speak for Garfield. The comet has long since been out of print, and I don't feel like pestering a 70-year-old man on his imaginary cat's opinions, so let me tell you why me and Monday have fallen out of fashion. You see, I'm approaching the age of 18, and with that comes three R's, reading, writing, and responsibility. And though I was versed in fine print checks and balances, I had not yet done a dalliance with what people call a square job. Not to say I hadn't worked before. I'd done odd jobs, intern, volunteer work, stuff in the summer, but in the traditional sense, my work history was as green as the cash that I received because real jobs use direct deposit. And <laughs> I'm getting off topic. <laughs> anyway, it was a Monday when I wrote this. Mom left the house before me, as is often the case when she works nights. We chatted for a scant few minutes before she caught her cat about my future. In the past, we've had conferences where we've covered careers with ever-increasing clarity, and consequently, I countered with varying levels of verity. Though this time, 
I decide to choose my words wise because no one wants to hear, oh, I don't know what I'm doing with my life at around 5.30, <laughs> even if that is when it normally happens. <laughs> she smiles and gives a few reassuring platitudes before going out the door and hobbling down our old stone stairs. A couple of months ago, I figured out why. Poring over bills and notes of how the house works, I noticed a few with the medical symbol. In a way, it almost fits, standing strong while being poisoned. Right, now I get it. Years of coming home with an aching body, a tired mind, and ravages of arthritis explained by two words, brain tumor. Calling, what it is, calling it what it is doesn't make it any different, just gives it a name so you pay more attention to it. And so every Monday, I'm reminded of mortality as I see her go off to cook for the sick and forgotten, as she's done for the past 17 years. Each day, making a note to myself to not let her become one of them. After all she's done for me, I figure it's the least I can do. Thank you. See why I like Wellspring. <laughs> Our next poet is Jessica Kennedy, Centennial High School. Jessica is an inspirational young woman. She goes to high school. She does the college program, too, for half the day. Works full-time, and is totally independent. So, Jessica. Woo! Woo, Jen! As he said, I do go to um, Centennial High School, and I go to Columbus State Half Day as well. Um, I would tell you something about myself, but working full-time and going to school full-time, there's not much to it. I mean, <laughs> there's sleep, work, and school, so <laughs> that's me. Um, this poem is not titled. Finding love in the dumpsters and telling yourself it's heavenly because that's all you've ever known. The idea of a crushed can falling jaggedly over the rough edge of that dumpster wall reminds you more of how your heart has ever felt than the beat inside your chest does. Mm. Boy told me the imprint of the end of a loaded barrel has been on the right side of his head too many times for him to count. He asked me if I ever tried. I swear I felt something jump out of my body, ready to attack him, forever asking me about the nights I sat on a cold wood floor, rocking back and forth like the chair my grandpa used to sit in that still sits in my grandmother's living room. I used to sit in that chair with him. His arms wrapped around me, the only male embrace that didn't feel like suffocation. He died before any of them got the chance to rip my lungs from my chest and pretend I was still breathing fine. But boy told me I was beautiful, that he cared, that he trusted me, not looking for reward, but looking to pick my cold tin layer off the alley floor. And for the first time, I wasn't thrown away when he realized I was as hollow as a pumpkin in October. He made me feel like it was okay to be Halloween every day of the year. Even though sometimes I hide behind changing faces, he still knows it's me under there. Boy, so used to illusion from girl that when I told him I wish changing faces would go away, he asked them to stay longer. Like, in some twisted way, he thought all of me was adorable. Hollow and changing and always looking in the wrong places. He thought all of me was adorable falling from his tender hands back on the alley floor because he must have realized I wasn't the kind of aluminum that was worth very much at the scrapyard. Now I know looking for love in dumpsters or in alleys won't get you much farther than rocking back and forth on cold wood floors. 
Thank you. Senior, you graduate this year. World, watch out. <laughs> She's a big softball star, too. Lexi can give us some poems. Uh, so, like Alan said, I'm a senior at Centennial High School. Um, me and Jess are actually on Centennial High School's Poetry Slam teams. No. <laughs> And we're going to win this year. Of course um, So if anyone <laughs> finds themselves in Columbus, Ohio. Oh, sorry, sorry. I love that one. Shade. So if anyone finds themselves in Columbus, Ohio, a week from today, actually, you can come see the slam and watch Centennial bring home the trophy. Woo! I'm going to get the beer either way. Every year. Oh. Um, but the piece I'm going to do for you guys tonight is my slam piece. Um, and it's my attempts of tackling what seems to be which seems to be coming an epidemic in my generation, um, which is suicide. Um, so this is my attempts to tackle that. <laughs> I do not remember how or when we became best friends or where that scar on your right ankle came from or why we started texting pictures of dogs back and forth, probably because dogs are dogs and everyone needs more dogs in their dogless lives. See, my entire life, I've watched my friends try to search for the exit that you found, lying in between the rivets of train tracks, trying to collapse their bodies just enough to make it seem like they were tied there against free will. And I remember that Monday morning. It was warm and sunny for November. I remember walking through the guidance office, laughing at some stupid joke somebody made. I remember the phone call the one that said she did not wake up, the one that said she killed herself. I remember knees weak under body weight, body on floor, phone on floor, tears on floor. I do not remember the next three days, but I remember them telling me she wouldn't look the same. She'd look pale and dead and lifeless, which would make so much sense. I do not remember who they were, but I remember them being wrong. I remember wanting to shake her awake from sleep, wanting her to be awake, wanting to sew her wrists back together and pump her back full of blood sea four months later. And I no longer remember the sound of her laugh or the color of her eyes, forced to rely on Facebook memories to remember anything besides the fact of how unlucky she was to have finally gone through with it. Last week, a college student I did not know fell from the top of the south parking garage of the Ohio State Union. That night, I woke up imagining this girl about to divorce heels from solid concrete, woke in cold sweat, woke up screaming, stop! Watch her plunge, catch my breath, whisper, I'm sorry. See, my sister asked if I would write her obituary for when she finally decides to kill herself. I tell her I will write her a song with a piano key as a pencil. I'd write a novel and make her the main character. I'd write a sad story with a happy ending where nobody actually dies. I tell her I will write her a sunset with all the colors melting together. I'd write 1-800-273-8255. That's the hotline. Call it, please. But I tell her no. I will not write your obituary because, friend, it may not get easier to get out of bed or to smile or to stare in the mirror right now, but it will. And I am allowed to say this, say I've searched for this exit also, stood under empty door frames in front of stalled cars. I've stared down the barrel of too many loaded guns, see? Two years ago, I swallowed a bottle of pills. Two years ago, I got lucky. Two years ago, I woke up. Oh, CC, it would have gotten better. It gets so much better. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and our final young poet, <clears throat> Thomas Ellison, 
Well, I've been lucky enough to get to know on a much deeper level this weekend. He was great last night, and I'm sure he'll be tonight. <coughs> in mid poem and then just you know never <laughs> anything. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Again, like Alan said. Uh, my name is Thomas Ellison. I'm currently a student at Central State University. Um, I'm a freshman um, studying mass communications and minoring in political science. And um, here you are. <clears throat> You can tell everybody you know, but please don't tell my mother. <laughs> tell my friends, I know you told me not to, but I couldn't take it anymore. Tell my professors, please excuse me for the rest of this semester. Give my boss my resignation letter. Tell my niece, I'm sorry I didn't have the courage enough to tell you because I knew it'll break your heart. Tell my grandfather, I'll see you in a little bit, but please don't tell my grandmother because I want her to be surprised for the first time she sees me. Tell my roommate, I'm sorry for the mess I made, and I'm sorry you have to clean it up, but hopefully they won't find you. Tell my heart to hurry up, hurry up, and stop beating. You can tell everybody, but please, don't tell my mother. Tell my pills to do that magic they do one last time. Tell my first psychiatrist, I'm sorry for wasting your time. Tell my second psychiatrist, I'm sorry for wasting your time. Tell my third psychiatrist, my first psychiatrist says hi, and I'm sorry for wasting your time. Tell my father if we end up making it to the same place would you please find it in your heart to spend some time with your son. You can tell everybody, but please Tell that little kid down the street that he is going to need a new big brother. Tell my dog there aren't going to be any more special treats. Tell the bank I'm sorry for the overdraft fee. Tell everybody. But please, again, don't, you know what? Doesn't matter anymore. Tell my fourth grade teacher I was not destined for greatness. Tell my 11th grade teacher I was not destined for greatness. Tell my high school basketball coach, you were right, I was not destined for greatness. Tell that golfer that pulled me over that I was up to no good and I shouldn't have amounted to nothing. Tell them you should have put those cuffs on me when you had the chance because I wasn't going anywhere in the first place. Tell the governor. Please let my mom keep my house. Please let my mom keep her house. Tell Barack Obama, no, I can't. Tell Donald Trump, I'll see you there. <laughs> Tell the pastor, thanks for trying. Tell the congregation, thanks for watching. But make sure you write this one down. Tell the Lord, that you have put me through hell and torment where I could not take it anymore. Tell God, my Savior, thank you. You see, because of you, my soul, body, and mind are as a sound as they ever been. Thank you for never giving up on me and keeping me under your wing. Thank you for that pain and torment and everything you've given me but the love. Thank you for the love. Now I can look up to the sky and smile and yell, thank you, Jesus! Tell my legs there is no more need to run. Tell my eyes there are no more need to cry. I have died, yes, but I have came back. 
That's a new soul. Tell everyone you know. Tell everyone you know. But please, do not tell my mother. Because I'll be able to tell her myself. Mm -hmm. With my arms open wide and a smile on my face. Tell my future self, I love you. Oh, yeah. And tell that guy they call Satan and everybody he associates himself with. Good game! I thought you had me this time. Spring is the best time of the year, I think. And if the earth wakes up, it wakes up something in me. talk about something today that's been a big inspiration in my life, and that's wilderness. Whether it's the outer wilderness or the inner wilderness that we can sometimes visit. I was going to just tell this story, but thanks to Thomas, I'm going to have to read it. It's, it's still kind of real. Once upon a time, once in a different time, and another time, it was like this, but not like this. A time when things were the same, but different. A time where time went in cycles instead of clicks and seconds. And when people seemed to be more tuned in to something deeper than it is now. Once in that time, there was a lonely hunter. One evening, Returning to his hut over the snow, he saw smoke coming from his chimney. When he entered his shack, he found a warm fire, a hot meal on the table, and his threadbare clothes washed and dried. There was no one to be found. The next day, he doubled back early from hunting. Sure enough, there was smoke again from the chimney, and he caught the scent of cooking. 
When he cautiously opened the door, he found a fox pelt hanging from a peg and a woman with long red hair and green eyes adding herbs to a pot of meat. He knew in that way that hunters know that she was fox woman dreaming, that she had walked clean out of the other world. The other world is the world right next to this one, the world of dreams and creation and imagination and poetry. I'm going to be the woman of this house, she told him. The hunter's life changed. There was laughter in the hut, someone to share the labor of crafting a life. And in the warm dark, when they made love, it seemed the edges of the hut dissolved in the vast green acres of the forest and the stars. Over time, the pelt started to give off its wild, pungent scent. A small price, you would think, but the hunter started to complain. The hunter could detect the scent on his pillow, his clothes, even his own skin. His complaints grew in number until one night the woman nodded just once, her eyes glittering. In the morning, she and the pelt and the scent were gone. It is said that to this day, the hunter waits by the door of his hut, gazing over snow, lonely for even a glimpse of his old love. As a culture, we've been so long removed from the scent of the wild that for most of us, it's not even a dim memory in our consciousness. I would like to explore what the wild has given to me as a poet in the broader sense of the word where poetry means the act of creating from the Greek poesis. It is 2007 and I stand on a promontory in East Greenland looking out at the icebergs floating in the ocean. It's light years away from the tiny house identical to the hundreds of houses surrounding it in a post-war development in St. Louis. I later write an aged Inuit stands on a promontory looking seaward. This has been his lookout spot for 50 years. He spies four groups of seals, seven, four, two, and one. His American companion, a visitor to East Greenland, strains his eyes and sees nothing but the water. Specialized vision is a survival mechanism. Recognizing blips in a pattern make the difference between another week of life and starvation. Perception is necessity. Shimmering colors in an abalone shell, russet oak leaves spiraling up a branch, the elegant curve of a woman's ear. The eye unconsciously embraces these images and the subconscious mind is stimulated to resonate to a deep archetypal sense of beauty. A gasp of surprise, a turn of the head, or a flutter of attraction results. What a land offers is more subtle, it must be viewed through the cycles of light and of seasons. Its skin of vegetation, birds and animals shift like iridescent oil on the surface of wind-blown water. Lying below are the rocks, the bones of the land. Their swirls, colors and crystals telling the ancient tale of cataclysmic struggles or the patient way of sand or shells. You must walk the land to know it, each step kissing its contours, each smell activating ancient stories. You must listen for the deep notes that resonate from below, and finally, if you are lucky, hear its voice rising in song. I have wandered across the world, across my life of comfort, across numerous preconceptions, to what Martin Shaw calls the deal beyond the things of this world. I am no longer in day-to-day, -day, pay the bills, go to work, cook the meals consciousness. It is lonely here and our vacation in Greenland is physically brutally difficult. Most would call it suffering, but I've been transported to a place of clarity, which opened me to the awe engendered by relating to the world through pure sensory awareness. <clears throat> when the alphabet was invented over 2,500 years ago, humans took the first steps onto a path 
that led away from experiencing the world in a purely phenomenological way. With mass literacy, direct sensory knowledge began to take a backseat to the written word. This revolution is greatly speeded up with digital technology that allows us to access a huge compendium of knowing instantly while we sit entranced in front of the screen. But where does inspiration come from? For me, it comes from the land, especially wild land, where the straitjacket of domesticity has been shed in favor of simply being part of the earth, senses attuned in the present moment. The wonders that come have been there all along, and I see them once my blinders are removed. Ancient wisdom is rife with this idea. Buddha under the great tree, vision quest or vision fast in a wild place at times of transition, Moses on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, Jesus in the wilderness for 40 days and 40 nights. It's interesting that we are in utero for 40 weeks, a new life, a new consciousness. A poem by Wendell Berry called The Peace of Wild Things. When despair grows in me and I wake in the middle of the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought or grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting for their light. For a time I rest in the grace of this world and am free. My friend Mike Sins walked into the wilderness after experiencing one of the greatest possible tragedies, the death of his daughter. Eight years of hiking in the remotest of places and exploring the most challenging of terrains, physical and emotional, brought him to a place where he can again feel happiness. I sit on a cool granite stone, part of the boundary of a tent circle. This has been an Inuit summer campsite back through time. Hunting seals and fishing in the endless light of high Arctic summer. On the earth, a mosaic of black and white cryptobiotic lichen. Grace notes of red stem mountain sorrel. Mackerel sky tailing off to cirrus streamers, all backlit by a sinking sun. Distant thunder of calving ice. A moth beats his wings low to the ground, its tiny tongue probing the flowers, a key entering a lock, waiting to mate and lay eggs where the coming cold will not find them. With slow breath and closed eyes, I hope to be infused with a drop of the Inuit essence spinning through the cycles of the year, the scent high in the nose of drying fish, the quick sharp laugh of a child, seal blood diffusing through the shimmering water. What would these hunters think of me? Clothes I did not make, no skills to find and kill game. Would they see in my eyes that my heart races with the beauty around me? Could they sense the quickening of my blood as the sun turns a small iceberg into glass, bottomless and blue? The chill breeze drives me down the hill to my tent for sleep, dreaming myself into this land. And entering that other world, the land of imagination, dream, and poem. The face that stares back at me is a familiar stranger. Tanned skin, peeling nose, smudges of dead mosquitoes, crow's foot lines like clefts in the ice-beaten granite shores, piercing eyes that have opened repeatedly to glowing blue ice, sculpted bergs, a horizon that expands in every direction. This face tells of a life that has been changed, a life that has dropped into a realm of timeless wonder and returned with new eyes that see into depths of imagination. A face that reflects the toil of continued balancing at the <coughs> limits of physical strength and endurance. A face beyond any previous borders on the map. To see the world anew and record my thoughts as a reminder that the world 
It's really more than it seems, and so are we. Thank you. And now one of my favorite parts of the Poetry Festival, the winners of our poetry contest. This year, we have something unique. We have um, a tie for third place, and then a second place in the first place. And one of our third place winners, who will now read her poem, is Kelly Fuller. salutation, a prayer for protection of the shoeless soul whose knotted sneakers straddle the power line between the bait store and the Golden Phoenix Buffet. May the goddess Nike, the poser god Adidas, and the CEO of Foot Locker all shower the, their goodwill upon your nakedness as you hobble homeward or to a meeting with your parole officer or a hot game of horse at the local playground. Protect each toe, callous, delicate arch and pronated step. Keep your waxed wings tight and firmly bound to your bronze shoulders. Let no broken glass, gift of the bull in the china shop, pierce your flesh or open a vein. Only please, please, step lightly to the center court in some asphalt carpeted schoolyard, the one Eisenhower <coughs> built as he sharpened his lawn jarts and carved suburbs out of asbestos, a labyrinth immune to flame and failure. May you find forgiveness and bless the one who tackled and toppled you, resting away the very appendages that gave you temporary flight, tying the gray laces together in a perfect Macy's Thanksgiving Day bow and heaving them skyward as you watched your severed pair catch over the power line and hold. A caution to other high-fiving, double-dribbling, half-court shot wannabes who went up for the dunk, high and aloft, Icarus and Red Knight. <laughs> Third place winner this year is Cindy Dubliac. these things because if you look around we're mostly old <laughs> and, um, so I really appreciate uh, uh, that opportunity the poem is called something pleasant changing your name after divorce is like changing your mind after it's broken split in two the one of you lecturing on the first day of class the other of you standing at the back of the classroom thinking hurry up already let them out early or you're not going to make it Memory is a wound, a scab which won't heal, the door to a room and a man you've forgotten, and words which, out, which come out before you can stop them. I'm not afraid, not afraid. You can't hurt me anymore. Forgetting comes disguised as a heart attack. Your refusal to admit when he pushed you to your knees, you decided you were nothing. So much nothing you could step out of your own body believe it was some other girl who was trying to breathe, nothing and no one, what you were, what you are. Your brother, at 11, showed you the hand as a miracle, flashlight pressed into flesh, illuminating 27 bones, veins, tissue, and you realize it's all connected, the pulsing of the heart, the tiny transit system, an orchestra of movement you would later think of cutting when living was exhausting. You hear your ballet instructor. She insists on perfect posture, being disappointed. You'll never be Isadora, the beauty whose own scarf wrapped around the angst of Axel, a tragic death, loved by all. What you think of when you cannot sleep, night after night after turbulent night, until finally you get up. 
make the walk through the darkness to your father, working up the courage to once again disturb his sleep. Exhausted by your nightmares, he says, think of something pleasant, think of something nice. And maybe I could say that thinking is the answer, that a pleasant thing is a good mind, straight A's, world peace, just leaders, clean water for everyone, or the calm that I feel in your arms these days. But all I could imagine at six was a rabbit, at ease in a field, sun warm on her coat, nose twitching to the smells of soil and honey, translucent ears listening, calm now, hearing nothing but crickets and daisies surrendering to the breeze. winner is one of our favorite people who comes with us from Cincinnati, who does a lot to promote poetry in Ohio, Susan Glasser. I submitted this poem before I learned that Greg Kimura died. And I wanted to say that I have a, a very strong memory, a, a story about him that I wanted to share first. It's related to this. Um, I didn't have many conversations with him. They were short. But what I remembered from him is many years ago when Ted Kuzer was here, and I believe it was at your home. Is that possible, where there was a, a luncheon? Yes. And, and Ted was up stairs like the Pope, <laughs> talking to us from um, a tower, it seemed like. And Greg was inviting us to put our poems, if we brought our own poems, to put them around the circle where the picnic tables were. And I watched him move to each piece slowly like a monk. He studied each piece thoroughly. And you could tell afterwards, he just looked off because he was so embodied with the piece that he read. And so it was a nonverbal experience, but it, it touched me deeply. So. <coughs> I forgot for Valerie's mother. I forgot to feel the fine, smooth curve of my mother's china plate while drying it at the sink. I didn't think to slow the pace, to fall in love with the biscuit-fired edge of our everyday plates either. Glaze blue, they are hypnotically easy to look at, but to touch their rough <coughs> circumference is another thing entirely. You have to be on time in your body. You have to cherish the air in your chest and in the bowl of your belly. You have to descend from the cloud of knowing in order to finger, to feel the backbone of what matters for happenstance to become substance. Certainly the sloppy speed with which I just unloaded groceries from the car then tossed the frozen vegetables into the freezer, like a farmhand pitching hay in a hailstorm tells you something. The undue violence of it all. I forgot how long it takes to come to our senses, years, now decades of practice. And what has it afforded me other than sighing at today's stupidity of habit? This remembrance. A child lying in the cool spring grass, feeling it was the ant, not the blade, that tickled my neck. Our winners are picked by.
satire of poets, and it was summed up in a good way by George Bilgear, one of our favorites that comes here. He said, oh, you want us to do it because we're leaving town tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> so this year our winner is someone new, the power of poetry, former teacher, yay, teacher, <laughs> from Cincinnati, yeah, Richard Haig. Congratulations. I'm happy to be here, and uh, I was planning on coming and, uh, you know, just to kind of get a picture of the scene, and then I saw you had a poetry contest, I said, oh, hard day, I got it. I think I got to enter that. So I'm very uh, happy that I did and happy to be here. And thanks. Uh, there's one name in this poem that you might need a little bit of footnote for. Don Blankenship was the head of Massey Energy in West Virginia during one of the worst recent mining disasters, and he is now in prison. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, this, is, this is poem is a, part of a sequence called Characters for a Novel of the Days. This is Groundhog Day. Whistle pig, your call goes out on a sour wind blown across the dump from the field where you live in a hole. Happy lot not to have need of what falls apart, requires wages to buy, burdens the earth when you toss and clean. Buy not, whistle pig. But in our sillying of natural history, you are a kind of dupe loaded with responsibility for weather, as if the coal we burn has nothing to do with it. The gasoline, the fracking, the blowhard, blank and ship lies. How witty of us to do this thing to you, to project upon you what should be ours, how to live in cold and dark, carefully, without killing any more than we have to. But you, earth-hugged, we have nicknamed ridiculously as one of us. And then watch in late winter your first sallies back into air and light. Responder, interpreter, prophet. We want someone else to tell us after freeze and sleep and spending. Rely on your feet, prepare the ground, remember, delve and sow and reap. Meanwhile, your place in the novel of the days is to remain oblivious until something happens in the country near you. Murder, perhaps, or a thieving of strange proportions. Someone stealing the courthouse, or a creek, or running off with half a year to raise hell with. These are only a few of the crimes already committed, still unnoticed in the general glare and blow then you will, in the round of your round vegetarian day, unknowingly excavate some sort of evidence, a tooth, a ring, the money, and a woods walker, saunterer among oaks and beaches, knower of ginseng and may apple, will find the evidence, see it for what it is. But as always, you will never know what you have done in and for the world of men, innocent thresher of soils, nabob of niches and rock veins, there where roots brush your familiar fur, both on the way home and on the way away. Thank you. to move into intermission I invite you to visit the bookstore. We have books by two of our poets, Shamika and Herb, and there are some books there, a new one by one of our old poetry friends, Susan Moeller, that's a ecology, which is a good segue right after that poem of Richard's. So we'll let you know when we're going to come back. Glad everyone's here, and the poets are geared up to give you a great experience in the second half.